be seated. Doug, I'm just going to cancel the screen. Not to put anything on the screen. I, I don't know if it's more distracting than than um, otherwise. I'll just make them open the Bible. That's what we'll, that's, that's what we'll do. And so you should sign, find some Bibles in, in front of you. If not, there's enough here. You can just go steal one from somebody else. I will, I will try to, but don't steal it for good. Just make sure you give it back. <laughs> and, and I will try to give you enough warning instead of me just rapid firing through them that, that, that turn with me. I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, the first portion of scripture I'll be in. Then I'll be going to Matthew 23 a little bit after that if you want to pre um, prepare um, to go there. Until we get that fixed, we're, gonna have, we're going old school here. Um, the last message I started talking, this is our intensive care series. I thought it was fitting because we have a projector on intensive care. <laughs> and it's really a, a, it's been a series about the condition of the church um, in America, specifically in America, and, and what we can do um, to fix the issues the church is facing. We first message, we talked about the size of the church. And really, in some estimates, people say the Christian church is 50 to 70% of the nation, but in reality, it's about 7 to 8% of our nation, much smaller than um, people and the political pundits even like to say. So we don't have quite the clout that we thought we've had for the last um, 30 or 40 years. The last week we talked about hated, how the church is basically hated. Of course, in the countries that don't embrace um, Christianity at all, it's persecuted. But in America now, where if you remember the statistic last week, 22% of our college professors um, have negative sense feelings about uh, Muslims. 53% of the same professors have um, negative feelings about Christians. So that's, that's our colleges. So you can see the, the, the hatred, or, that's, or maybe that's just too strong of a word, the, dis, the displeasure, the, the repulsion, the rejection of our Christian presence in America is, is well documented. And it's not going anywhere. It's been propagating itself for quite a while now. Now, the last message... I talked about two big cherry laurel trees in my yard. My house was built in the 1950s and in the subdivision over by Tyrone Mall. And um, what they did back then, they used the same basic bushes in every yard. I mean, I, I had to rip all mine out, put new stuff in. But if you were going back, you'd find a little red, um, I forget the name of it, the little red flower bush that was there. And, and lots of cherry laurel trees everywhere. And well, my tree, as I noticed, I, I told you, I was mowing my lawn about five or six years ago, and I'm just mowing near the tree I'm looking and and um, I, I'm sorry I'm mow, I was mowing my award-winning lawn and and and, um, and and I was um and I noticed there was some ants crawling all around my tree so I looked and I poked in there and um, and there's a lot of ants crawling on my cherry laurel tree so I went and got some raid and I sprayed it in there thinking I'd kill all the ants thousands of ants came out. They didn't like that. They didn't like the raid stuff. And, uh, and then thousands of ants came out of that tree. I said, wow, that's, that tree is infested with these ants. And so I called a tree guy because that tree was a big tree and it was sort of close to my house. And, and you know, I was afraid someday we'd get a tropical storm or worse, a hurricane come through and I needed a roof. And so, so there was, I, I had the guy come and said, said this tree is eaten throughout. And um, we, you got to take it down. He goes, I don't think it could withstand uh, a 40, 50 mile an hour wind. And I can, he showed me where it was just, when he cut it, it was just eaten throughout. Checked the tree next to it, and that tree was about just not as compromised. But anyway, they both had to go. And so the essence, I told that story last week in the principle of the, the winds of the, of the world, the, the current of the world um, could blow that tree over. And, and, but when you looked at the tree, you wouldn't think anything was wrong with it. The tree being the church, by sight, it looked like a normal tree. It had green leaves, it was high, but in close inspection, it was, it was corroded and, and eaten up and could no longer withstand a, a normal storm um, or a tropical storm would have blown that tree over. Now, that was the principle because we're in that storm called the United States of America if you're a Christian today, but... I want to go back to my, laurel, my cherry laurel trees because there was a, another principle attached to them. Um, before, before any storm could come and blow that tree over, 
the tree had to be internally compromised. The tree itself had to lose its strength. If the tree had never lost its strength, um, no storm could have ever blew it over. It would have been okay. It would have been secure. But in fact, because he had these big old ants in there for a long, long time, it ate away the strength of the tree. It corroded, if I want to use that term, the, the strength of the tree. And I want to use that principle today because I want to present to us somewhere in the last 20 years, we have become as we have become more marginalized as the church in America, and that's what I'm talking about, that you're not national, not internationally, but especially nationally, as we become more marginalized, as, as the world has become more amoral, as the world has become more um, atheistic, it's, and you can point the fingers at, at a lot of different things, and we've been doing that a little bit, we understand that the problem started in the house of God. It didn't start out here didn't start in the world. The decay started, I believe, in the house of God. The world, my friends, is not our enemy. It's our mission field. Um, The world is not our problem. We are our own worst enemies, the church. And then again, I'm not talking about Grace Connection Church. I'm not talking, I'm just talking about the church in the last 20 or 30 years nationally in America. Now, I'm going to reiterate something. I'm going to actually show this on the screen for you next week. I call it the, the cone of, um, of decay. And if I, if I had a big old cone up there, and this is, this is going to represent 50 to 70, 70 years, and the top cone is our senior citizens today, they have this tremendous moral emphasis and moral code and moral dogma to, dogma to them, and they, they hold down the fort, they're in churches, they're tithing their income, and these are our seniors. These are our 65 to, to and up, 70 and up um, folks up there, and they really, that generation has kept the church afloat for a long time. Then the generation right under that, that would be me, um, we somewhat, we're not as powerful as they are in our Christian witness, but, but this cone just sort of goes down like this. And this is our generation right here. Now, from the beginning of my generation to the end of that generation is about 30 years. Okay? And I'm not in the seniors' generation yet, but I'm not too far away from it either. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a decade or 15 years away from it. In 30 years, if I remain somewhat healthy, I'm going to be checking out. I'm going to be saying goodbye, and you're going to come to my memorial service and say, he was a good man, <laughs> if you don't go first. <laughs> and um, and so, so there is a, so we have this, but after us, and this cone goes like this. If Father's people has a Christian worldview, it goes like this. Senior generation, my generation, then the generation coming up after me goes, Phew. just like that. And as it goes down into what we'll call the millennial age, the 20s and the teens, it goes down, it's just more and more, it's very, it tapers right down to a point that is coming generate like my little 10-year-old's age. Now, that means if this cone up here, the seniors, yeah, you guys still have work to do, and us um, don't somehow influence this down here, then we have 30 years. 30 years, and the Christian church as we know it in America will have an absolute different face. Churches, buildings like this will be vacated wholesale. There won't be enough people to keep them open. There won't be enough resources to keep them open. There'll still be churches. There'll still be big churches. There'll still be full-time ministry going on, but not as much. In fact, nowhere near as much. And the Christian church now, you think it's marginalized now? Wait for 30 years from now. We're going to be a speck on the American landscape if things don't change. The book of Ephesians, um, the first three chapters, I love the book of Ephesians. It sort of puts the whole Christian life in a perspective here. The first three chapters have some of the best theology in all the Bible. It talks about who we are in Christ, all spiritual blessings, seated together with Christ in heavenly places, 2-6, forgiven, 1-7, um, um, saved by grace, 2-8, um, preordained to good works, 2-10. I mean, it just goes on. God who is rich in mercy, 2-5. And it just goes on, um, this dispensation of grace, 3-2. And it's just, 
this, this beautiful picture of what the cross did for you and I. And then in chapter 4, he sort of takes this theology that he teaches us in chapters 1, 2, and 3 and says, now I want to show you what it looks like in real life. This is what this theology, it's not just a pretty picture on the wall, this is what it looks like in real life. And I'm going to pick that up here in Ephesians chapter 4. If you have your Bibles open, if not, you just have to listen very carefully. I'll read slow. Therefore, I. <laughs> a little faster than that, maybe? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Therefore, I, Paul's talking, a prisoner, and I, let me just stop for a moment. Therefore, always looks back. Remember that? Wherefore, therefore, always looks back. So what's looking back to? Chapters 1, 2, and 3. And, and, and in essence, he's saying, in light of what I've already taught you, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. That's what it says here. Be patient with each other. This does not include your spouse. <laughs> oh, that's not in there. I'm sorry. That, it just says be patient with, with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Did Paul just say I had a fault? He did. He just said I have a fault. Wow. So it's be, be making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. He's talking to the church here. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope in the future. So this is Paul's message to the church at Ephesus. He goes, listen, I'm a, I'm, in, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I want you to be humble and gentle with each other, patient with each other, allow each other to have, be human, if I can paraphrase it that way, just knowing that you're, you're sitting next to other human beings that have weaknesses and faults and fears and insecurities and losses in their life. No one's perfect. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So the first thing that we need to, I, I believe, the evangelical church, that 7 to 8%, these are the things I think that are important. There's other things I don't think are that important. And I don't, I'm going to talk more about the non-important things, but here are some things I think we've got to agree on. And what one person called essential doctrines. These are doctrines that unite us, don't divide us. These are the things we all agree on. We might not all agree when the rapture of the church was coming, but, but we can all agree on these things. We, we can all agree that the Bible is the word of God, worthy to be trusted. We can all agree with that. If you're a Pentecostal, you can agree with that. If you're a Baptist, you can agree with that. If you're a Methodist, you can agree with that. If you're a Lutheran, you can agree with that. The thing, these are the things that make us evangelical. We believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the depravity of man because Christ told us that. We believe in the substitutionary atonement, a theological term for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. That's all that means. We believe in Christ, Christ's complete humanity. He's very God and very man. The theologians like to call that the hypostatic union. What's that mean? Go ask a theologian. <laughs> and um, we, have, we believe in com the complete deity and, and the sufficiency and the ex exclusivity of Christ's work. We believe that the, we all have a need for a personal relationship with Christ. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture. That was, those are the things that unite us. Those are the things that keep us together. Now, non-essential doctrines, I'm not going to go through all of them, there's too many. And I'm not saying they're not important, but I'll, I'll say this, some very good Bible-believing people disagree on that. I have a library full of commentaries, thousands of books, and I read them, and it's funny how this guy who is brilliant disagrees with this guy who is brilliant. So what do I do? I just find the thing that makes most sense to me, and I, that's what I believe. Am I going to die on a hill on that? No. That's baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
gifts of the Spirit, non-essential doctrines, nothing that should divide us. Calvinism, big one today. Arminianism versus Calvinism. Calvinism has a resurgence today. I'm not Calvinistic, I'm dispensational. Some of these terms probably had absolutely no idea to you. And that's okay. That's why, they're not important. I have books in my library from Calvinists. I have books in my library from Arminians. I have books in my library from dispensationalists. I just don't use the parts I don't use, and I use the parts that I think are good, that's all. I'm not going to make issues out of it. We co-labor with other churches. We have chaplains groups here. I have dear friends, a Wesleyan pastor up in Pinellas Park, Pastor Phil, one of my dearest friends. The Pharisees, some of my dearest friends. I have relationship with other men that may not share my faith, or at least my doctrine. They share my faith, my doctrine. And those things just don't matter to us. We're not going to let things separate us that don't need to separate us. But those same men I mentioned, they believe in the core tenets of our faith. So there are essential doctrines that unite us. They don't divide us. And that's important that we go forward that way. Now, one of the biggest reasons I feel that the church has fallen behind the culture Lots of reasons for this. We'll talk more about them coming up. Um, but one of them is we have mixed our Christianity with our churchianity. And that's sometimes a very fine line that people don't always see. Christianity and its message has changed the world. Just go back 2,000 years and look at the world then, look at the world now. Christianity and its message has changed the world. The Christian church, however, has not always reflected the Christian message to the world or even to each other. And trust me, the world sees that. Our churchianity is often made of issues of things that have no biblical value to them. I'm going to get a little rough with, with some of us here in the next couple services here. Our worship, our worship preferences in churchianity were guarded. This is what I like. And we go in our churches and we divide our churches over music. And we think somehow that one type of Christian music is, is more spiritual than another type of Christian music. And we elevate the hymnal the same level as the Bible. That is wrong. You have a preference of Christian music. I know for a fact God loves Southern gospel. Because <laughs> he likes what I like. But we don't do a lot of Southern gospel here because all the people don't necessarily like Southern gospel music. I know in heaven you're going to have the, the, the singing angels, the, 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 the heavenly choir, and Bill Gates is going to be part of that. <laughs> I know that. But you guys not might feel the same way as me. And you know what? I don't really care because it doesn't matter to me. I don't think my way is the best way. It's just what I like. So I'm not going to let my churchianity divide and, and, and interfere with my Christianity. I, I'm not going to love my style of music more than I love human souls. Some of us have been so dogmatic in protecting how we do church, you don't care about the people across the street. I talked to a dear waitress in Chili's, this is a while ago now, a few years ago. And she went to a particular church. She knew I was a pastor. She goes, well, I went to this church. She was not a believer. But she goes, I wanted to check this church out. I walked into this church, and, and I felt, I'm walking down the aisle to get a seat, and I felt a tap on my foot. And there was somebody with a cane sitting in the front row tapping my leg with a cane saying, you got to put on a longer skirt. So I walked out, she said. That was her experience with church. See how churchianity can really invade our Christianity? Instead of seeing a soul, she didn't know that person. First time she ever stepped in that church. She was more concerned about the length of her skirt than she was her soul. Her soul wasn't even on her radar screen. We make non-biblical issues as important as real biblical issues. Now, listen to what Jesus said about this, because this is cool. Matthew chapter 23. He is um, talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the spiritually elite of the day. They had it down. They tithe everything. Even they, got, they even got the like, spices in the market. They you have 10% to God. 
they'd stand on the street corner and fast and let everyone know they were fasting too. They'd go out there and start praying. And they were the most respected people in the community, the Pharisees, because these guys were the Navy elite. They were the seals of spirituality. That's what they were. Look what Jesus said about them. This is God talking to the religious churchianity people of the day. And I'm cutting, I'm cutting into a whole passage here, and so it's a, but read Matthew 23. This whole thing is pretty compelling. Verse 3. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. He's talking to the, the, the disciples. Don't follow these guys' examples, for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, For you cross land and sea to make one current convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell than you are yourselves. (laughs) He's not. He's just killing these guys. This is Jesus talking to them. This is as brutal as any passage in the New Testament in, in the Gospels. And it's not directed towards a woman caught in adultery. It's not directed towards the people that's doing crazy things. It's not talking to prostitutes. He's talking to the religious people. The professional churchianity people. Verse 23. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, mercy, and faith. faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, he calls them. You strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you? Jesus talking. You teach as a religious law, you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's what Jesus felt about churchianity. The churches proclaim, my friends, moral holiness on Sundays, but on Mondays, they live like the rest of the world. That, our hypocrisy has probably done more to damage our input in the world than anything else. We hold up our placket of being a member of this church or that church or we go to church or whatever church it is. But from Monday to Saturday, we live just like the rest of everyone else. There is no humility. There is no meekness. There is no love. There is no acceptance. And in some cases, there's no honesty and integrity in business. If I put a little fish on my business card, I, 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 I would expect that you would live up to that reputation. Even to your own hurt. In 30 years of pastoring, I can't even tell you how many times I've seen Christians take advantage of other Christians and Christians take advantage of people in the world and we wonder why our influence has diminished. Because they don't see anything but somebody who goes to church on Sunday but is just like them the rest of the week. Hypocrites. We make the road to hell a lot easier for people when we act like that. See, there's a difference in kingdoms. Churchianity views life through the kingdom of self. It's my Christian life, my relationship, my money, my church. I I manage everything through through, um, self. Church and the people in church is an asset, maybe. It's a place to get my needs met, not an emotional acceptance needs. Not bad in itself. It's just narrow. Christianity views things through the kingdom of God. This is where all my values are elevated. My priorities are elevated. 
I view my relationship with my church, my spouse, my family, and others, my money, my gifts, and time through the kingdom of God. If I'm a dad or a mom, a husband or a wife, I treat my spouse with dignity and respect. I love them. I speak kindly to them. I have their back and they have mine. That's a marriage or a relationship that will actually bear witness to the world. But I'm a, if, I'm a, if I berating my children, berating my wife, berating my husband all the time behind the scenes, if I'm going to work and not working, if I'm going to work and not putting in eight hours of work for eight hours of pay and taking advantage of my boss and taking advantage of my company and going to the water cooler and complaining like the rest of the world complains and whines, how do we expect the world to see Christ in us? We've got to be different than the rest of them. We have to be. And I have to determine myself to be different than the rest of them. And it starts, well, let me tell you where it starts. I'm skipping a bunch of parts of the message here. You ever hear of the Battle of Kruger? Famous battle. You can look it up. They actually have footage of it on YouTube. It was um, 76 million views when I looked at it this past, this past week. Kruger is a national park in Kenya, I believe it is. And, um, and, and it's a national reserve park. And, and there was a herd of water buffaloes, um, those big bison. I mean, they're beasts. They're like the toughest animals in Africa. And there was a pride of lions that were hunting the buffaloes. And there was a little itty-bitty baby buffalo. And the lions singled this one out to eat it. They were hungry. They didn't have Chick-fil-A. And so there was, so, so they, they attacked the, the buffaloes. The buffaloes all run, and the little herd gets separated. They separate the little calf out, and they tackle the calf, and, the, and they jump on it, and they sort of roll into the edge of a lake a little bit. Some of you might have seen this. It's 76 million people have watched it. They're filming the whole thing. So they're on this little calf. You can hear the calf crying out, bellowing out, asking for help. And all of a sudden, two crocodiles come out of the water, and they hook onto the calf. So now the lions are fighting with the crocodiles, so who's going to eat this little calf? The lions won that. They, they got the little calf away from the crocodiles, and they pull it back up on shore, and, uh, and, then, and then they start attacking this little calf, and you can still, the calf is still alive. He's still making a, a racket. Then you look up, the camera pans up. About 150 water buffalo show up. And it's sort of, they move, they circle the lions on top of the calf. Next thing you know, you see a lion about eight foot in the air because he threw him. Next thing you know, there's a water buffalo chasing a lion and the lion's running for its life. And within a few seconds, they're all running for their lives, being chased by a herd of 150 water buffaloes. And the little calf, all of a sudden, the herd opens up. The little calf runs into the herd and the herd surrounds the calf, last time you saw him on film, he was assuming fine. That's the story. We could learn something from that. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 36, then I'm going to go to John 13 in a moment. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all parts are glad. Want to send a message to the world? First, show unity right here. This funny thing about water buffaloes, I got intrigued with them as I studied for this message. I was reading about them. They're very um, territorial in a sense. Not, that's not the word, but they have a, a social order. They have the big bulls, and the big bulls run the herd, and they have the ones that lead the herd. And, and then, but always these young bulls are always rising up within the herd, and they're challenging the big bulls to fights. And, and when the young bull finally beats the big bull, he's the boss. I mean, some of these fights will go to death. They're brutal with one another, these fights. When somebody in their herd is attacked... All fights in the herd stop, and they all focus on the one attacking. The young bulls, the big bulls, the females, it doesn't matter. When somebody in the herd is isolated, they all become one in the same focus. Oh, I wish the church was like this. 
Wouldn't that be something? Remember when the big PTL scandals of the 80s, going to the Christian bookstore and seeing a book in the Christian, put out by a Christian publisher, the truth of the PTL scandal. Why? Why would I want to write a book about that? And why would I want to read a book about that? Why would somebody else's failure intrigue me so much? Why would somebody else's sin cause me to want to read about it? Should make me sad, it should make me pray, it should make me love, it should make me support, it should make me forgive. But it shouldn't get me on my little high, righteous, pharisaical horse and say, aha, hypocrite. Yeah, you're right. I don't know any people who aren't, including this one. You know what a hypocrite is? Somebody who acts contrary to their stated belief. I believe certain things. But I don't always do them. Pastor Kelly, you're confessing a lot of things. No, not really, because I know you don't either. <laughs> so I'm a good company. So if I'm a hypocrite and you're a hypocrite, what hope do we have? It's called grace and mercy. John 13, verse 34 and 5 says this. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. What he just said there, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus said that. He says your love will evangelize the world. Your love will show the world who I really am. Your love for one another, and I venture to say your love for the people out here. Romans 15, verses 5 through 7. May God, who gives this patience, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for the followers of Christ Jesus. That's Romans 15, verse 5. Then all you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 7, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. It is only then, this is my friends, that the world will see something different about us. If we ever want to take our spiritual pulse as a church, Shall we love one another, support one another. We lost our daughter. We had meals given to us for three months, 90 days. I caught it off after a while. I weighed 375 pounds. <laughs> but 90 days, people bring in meals. They would cook and they would go out of their way and give us gift cards. Three months, that was the body of Christ. When one is hurt, we surround them. When one needs something, we're there. When one's attacked, we're all attacked. You want the world to see a living Christ in a real church? It starts with us, my friends, being real people in a real church that love one another and get off our churchianity high horse and accept people for who they are in their differences, in their weirdness, because you're all a little weird starting right here. And we accept each other just as we are and we love them unconditionally. Then the world looks in and says, I need that because it's not out here, but it's in here. That's where it's supposed to be, in here. Jesus, thank you for these words and thank you for the precious people. <laughs> Father, there's <clears throat> sometimes easier said than done inside the body of Christ. There's wounded spirits, hurt feelings sometimes. And Sometimes roots of bitterness and sometimes people flesh out and they say things they shouldn't say and sometimes they make it right, sometimes they don't. Father, we're imperfect to say the least. But Father, I just pray that you would bless our church and help our church be the witness that you want our church to be, Father. Help us start right here loving one another 
loving those in Sunday school, loving those different than us, loving those of a different generation. Help us, show us how to do that. Father, if there's anybody here who's never asked Jesus Christ to be their Savior, nobody loves you more than he does. You might not have answers. You may have big questions. That's okay. That's okay. Nobody loves you more than Jesus Christ. And a relationship, a relationship with him is simple. It's just for the asking. Jesus, bless our offering we're about to give as part of our, our worship. We commit the rest of the service to you. Amen.